shadows fall on the walls again dancing with ghosts of the people I've been have they gone and died or are they living here inside Hello my friend and welcome to this video about how I scan my film. This is going to be one of several videos kind of relating to my film post-production, which is going to include the equipment that I'm using to scan the film right now, as well as editing my film photos, kind of that process, what it looks like to convert the negatives into positive images and how or if I go about editing them and then how I go about storing them, organizing them digitally, as well as how I go about storing and organizing them physically, the negatives. So this is just going to be one part of the series of videos, but this one is going to be dealing specifically with the equipment that I use for scanning, some of the setups that I've tried in the past, where I'm at right now, as well as the actual process of putting film through the system and getting digital photos of the negatives. As much as I would like to make this one comprehensive video, I've decided I think it'll be best to split it up over a few videos and then to cap off a series of videos with a big Q&A sort of thing. So if you have any questions, please comment them below because I can't do a comprehensive video all at once uh, and I can't do it especially if I don't know what people want to know. So let's just go ahead and start with what's on the table. And the first thing I wanna talk about is the 3D printed film holders because these are the last system that I was using prior to upgrading here. I was using these with the Relino LED video light and I used that particular video light because it has a flat back so that you can lay it straight down on the table and the controls are on a side panel so that you can control the brightness and the color and things like that. But I never needed to use the controls, so having a flat back, I was able to turn it on, I was able to place my film holders right on top of the light source, and then all I did was use a cardboard black paper to mask out the extra light. And so this was my last scanning setup, and aside from the video light, it was really affordable, a library locally was able to print these for me for free. And I was even able to print something a little more advanced here, which is a knob rotation film holder. So I was able to get some rubber O-rings and I was able to install a rotating knob so that I could advance my film without having to touch anything. So. Um, 3D printing is a great option, especially with that affordable video light. I'll link everything below, but that was one of my first setups. And before that, I cut up a piece of cardboard. I cut up a cardboard box and I had completely rigged myself a film scanning setup for pretty much nothing. And I was just using a tripod. And then when I upgraded to this system, all I did was I bought a right arm attachment, an overhead attachment for my tripod. And so I was still using a tripod that I already owned. All I had purchased was a video light, got these for free because my local library was able to print them. And that was my setup for a little while and it worked just fine. This now was a pretty big upgrade I was really excited because it just adds a little bit more convenience and speed. But before we get into this here, I'll go over some of the other things on the table. Gloves are pretty much a necessity. You can scan film without it. I just would not recommend it because you are inevitably going to touch your negatives. You can handle it by the edges and you should with gloves too, but inevitably it just feels like you're always going to end up accidentally touching your film. So I would say, getting a box of cotton gloves is a really good investment. And with that, a rocket blower, because um, if you don't have a rocket blower, you can use compressed air. Either way is fine. 
but this is going to help clean your dust off your negatives because that is one of the downsides of camera scanning your film versus flatbed or other scanning is that there is no dust removal tools that are just built into the process. So anyway, this is a good tool to have. And then in addition to dust control, this is a great tool to have and it is a anti-static cloth. I believe it's from Ilford. And that's a great tool. I'll show how I include that in my workflow, but it definitely helps when controlling dust in the camera scanning process, because again, that is definitely a weak point in this process versus the traditional scanning processes like flatbed or dedicated film scanners. The last thing that I have here on the table worth mentioning there's two things. First, lens wipes. Those are really convenient to have around. They are just great for cleaning surfaces or things that are involved with electronics, whether you just need it for your camera screen to see if you're focusing correctly uh, or to keep your light box or um, system clean. So having these around, really nice. The real last thing actually is having any form of basically a trigger. So you can have a remote wireless trigger, you can use your cell phone, you can turn your shutter on a two second timer, but I just prefer to have a handheld trigger so that my shutter is not being pressed by my finger and causing shake because your shutter speed does end up being around 1 50th or 1 60th with my particular setup, but relatively slow enough to possibly introduce shake. So having kind of finalized some of the small stuff here on the table and some of my past setups and the way I've gone about film scanning before, now to the main components of my setup. The Fuji X-T3 is my camera of choice. In part, that's because it's my backup camera right now to my Fuji X-T4, which is recording me. And it's just nice because it's usually not in use actively for me. And so I'm able to kind of sometimes leave it set up as a film scanning camera. Um, and I'm certainly just less concerned about leaving it here on the mount. And so that is uh, the camera that I've chosen to use with a seven artisan 65 millimeter macro lens. It's definitely not probably the best lens available, but it is very affordable, which is a big concern for me. And so it's done the job. I've never noticed any major problems that have come by way of it. It focus breathes pretty significantly. It only manually focuses. The aperture ring is all manual. There's no electronics involved, but that's why it's so affordable probably. One of several reasons I'm sure, but it has served me really well for this purpose. I don't use it for anything else and I'm glad to have it for camera scanning. So then, the copy box here. This is called the Skyr or the Skier Sunray Copy Box 3, and it is a mouthful. I have the version which includes a 120 and a 135 mask, and I will have links below to this. It is a unique product because I believe it's handmade. I don't know that it's factory made, and so when you order it, particularly from B&H, I believe that it's a custom order. So anyway, that was something that uh, kind of threw me off, but I really love the product. I will be making a separate video about the product because I do think that it deserves its own conversation because it's such a unique and great piece in my workflow. So it's the Skier or Skyer Sunray Copy Box 3, and you'll see more of that later on. Otherwise, the final pieces here that I do need to mention are my little homemade coffee stand. And basically it is a floor flange, a plumbing pipe, and then a Manfrotto super clamp with my own custom head mount, my quick release mount here. So this is the quick release mount that I use for everything in my workflow for video and photo. So having that mounted onto a Manfrotto quick release with a ball head, forgot to include the ball head, and then that's merely attached to some plumbing pipe, which is attached to my desk. 
And this is just a little homemade desk table thing. I use it for other stuff as well. All I do is I unscrew my uh, plumbing pipe here and I can use it for other stuff, but you could just attach plumbing pipe to a, uh, you could attach it to a cutting board or anything else. I've seen a lot of solutions online for that, but the plumbing pipe you'll note as well is very tall and long, but I never knew if I would change my macro lens and if I'd need to get farther away. So I prefer it being too long than too short and having to worry about adding length later on. That right there is everything that I use for camera scanning my film. You definitely could change out any one of these pieces. There's really only a few core components that you absolutely have to have and none of those have to be the same as what I use here. I've seen plenty of people use copy stands or in larger stands instead of plumbing pipe with a super clamp. And then I've seen plenty of people use a vast number of combinations of copy box options or light table with option on top of that. There are plenty of brands out there, plenty of names that are making great products for film scanning. But this is what I've been using. This is what I've used in the past and I've gotten results that I'm really happy with. One thing I wanna say very clearly is that you do not have to have my exact setup in order to get good camera scans. And you certainly don't have to have an expensive setup because when I was using these pieces of equipment here, my total camera scanning setup to me was approximately $50 for that light source that I was using. And that was pretty much it because I already owned a tripod. And so you don't have to have expensive and dedicated pieces of equipment for camera scanning, but some of those things add more convenience and more features that you might enjoy having. But don't walk away from this video thinking that if you don't have an expensive setup, that that means you can't get good scans. One note I wanna make mention of real quick is that this right here is half frame film and that will be getting its own video because I kind of came up with a unique workflow for my half frame process, I think, that has really benefited the way that I shoot half frame as well as the way that I experience the scanning process. So that will be its own video. In this video, I'm only going to cover 135 as well as 120. All right, down to the final notes before I actually put on the gloves and start the scanning process is the fact that dust control is probably one of the most important parts of the camera scanning process. Sorry for the quick interruption. This is editing John talking here. I totally forgot to mention that you need to clean your camera sensor. For the first two months of camera scanning, I was getting this stupid dot on every single one of my images. So I actually returned a light source, bought a light source, tried everything I possibly could, and I was telling my friends about it, and one friend in particular, finally, thank you, Steven. Steven, you're watching this, you know. Thank you, because he said, oh, maybe you have something on your sensor. And I realized all in a moment that all of this trouble that I was facing and this frustration that I was feeling was because my camera sensor had dirt on it. So clean your camera sensor. That's a great step that absolutely needs to happen before you start camera scanning. So back to the video. So don't do what I did in order to make this video, which is allow your negatives to sit around for a couple of days before scanning them. My recommendation would be to get them back from the lab or to finish developing them at home yourself and to as quickly as possible scan them so that your surfaces aren't getting dusty after cleaning them and that your film isn't collecting dust uh, even inside of its plastic sheet. Um, I would just recommend getting the film scans back from the, or getting the film back from the lab or finishing your developing, cleaning your workstation, and then going straight into the scanning process because dust control matters a lot for this process. Another thing, of course, is that you would never scan your film in direct light like this. Of course you can, it's just not a good idea because you don't want any single light, you don't want any other light sources causing flaring in your image or causing irregular reflections or anything at all. So typically you would scan in the dark and if you're in a natural light situation like I am, all you'd have to do is buy a blackout curtain or 
if you were able to condense your scanning setup to placing it on top of a wooden cutting board or something similar, you could scan in a bathroom or a dark room that has no windows. And you would have a temporary little setup, something small, and you'd be able to scan in the dark any time of day. Quickly, something I forgot to mention before switching my camera here is that you need to set up a mirror or you need to find some way of making sure that your lens's focal plane and the horizontal plane of the film is almost exactly the same because otherwise you'll end up with a shifted focus in your image and your film won't end up perfectly tack sharp. So making sure that you find a way to level your lens and your camera with leveling the box, the copy box, or whatever source you're using as well because otherwise you'll end up with focus shifting and things like that. The mirror has been the most popular trick that I've seen that is very accessible, it's easy to do, and it's probably free because you might have one at home. So that's what I've done. I've already established mine. It's already level, so we're good to go. As I go about the process here, I'll just go ahead and make some notes on what I'm doing. So uh, before I open up the film, I'm going to just do a quick dust run over top of it. Uh, and then when I actually open it up, I'm going to run my finger down the length of the film to remove it. And then this is a part where I do find this helps immensely when working with this particular camera scanning process is that this anti-static dust cloth here is really helpful because when you run it down the film, you're cleaning the film, but you're also preventing dust from sticking to it. And so um, don't ask me how these anti-static cloths work because it's just magic. Um, but now that the film is clean and ready to go, I'm going to insert it on the left side here and I do scan with the emulsion side up. So technically my images are backwards, um, but this won't matter, we can fix that later. So now I'm gonna turn on my light source and it's about to get a lot brighter. So there we go. Now we have a negative showing through. I'm gonna turn on the camera up here and you can't see these settings yet. I will end up showing them. But what we have is the ISO as low as it can possibly go, which is on Fujifilm 180, or 80 is the lowest ISO. And then the shutter speed is currently set at 1 60th of a second. And now I'm gonna go ahead and show you what my settings look like here so that you can kind of see how a negative should end up looking so that you can get results that are pretty darn good. So I'm gonna walk through a few settings here in the camera, but none of the settings themselves are what make a difference. But I'm gonna show you a few tips and tricks to kind of apply this to your own scenario. So right now I've got my ISO set as low as Fuji allows at 80, and then I've got my shutter speed at a 60th of a second, and then I've got my aperture at F8, but because it's a manual lens, it's set on the lens, you won't see it here. However, all of that's gonna change when you're using your own camera. So I'm actually gonna show you how to use your histogram and how to use your EV, your electronic meter, to read the scene so that you can set up your own settings however you want. So the first trick that I do is I move my film so that I can just see my light source and my light source is represented here on the right side, you know, upside down, but uh, technically this is the right side of my histogram. And I'm just gonna show you what happens when I move my shutter speed up to 125th or 100th, is that you start to see this is no longer peaking. So white here is no longer pure white. Whereas if I go to an 80th of a second, I begin to peak, but my black is now still pretty dark. So I'm gonna go up just one more and that's how I end up at a 60th of a second. Is that at 1 60th, I am peaking, but my shadows have also begun to come off of the left wall here, which is 
the darkest black point. And now when I move the film back onto the image here, you'll see that most of my histogram is populated right there in the middle, which is exactly where I want it to be. And you see that I'm just barely above zero on my EV. And this I have found to be a great way of setting it up. And this is going to change per camera system, per light source that you're using. So just take those tips and tricks and I think that's going to give you a great exposure uh, on your own camera and your own light source. One more tip before I cut back to the other angle is that I set up my grid lines and I set up my copy box so that the film, when it's inside of the proper boundaries of the copy box, is right flush up against one of these lines here. It doesn't matter which line, but this allows me to keep it consistent so that when I crop later in Lightroom, I'm able to just crop consistently every time because I lined up the images while scanning them. Otherwise, basically your white balance should just be fixed. Uh, it's shooting raw anyway, so technically it doesn't matter, but fixing it on daylight, which is typically your light source, is probably just a good idea. Otherwise, make sure you have it on raw, not JPEG. Don't ever camera scan on JPEG, always on raw. And then another last option when it comes to your camera and this is something I haven't mentioned yet, but you could be using a tethering option uh, to a computer so that the files are just moving straight onto your Lightroom or straight onto whatever you're editing with um, or your computer, but I'm just recording it to an SD card. So I have plenty of space. I have 1800 or 1086 images available, but make sure that you have enough space on whatever storage you're using. So now that I've got everything set up on the camera, I've got everything set up here. I've cleaned my whole workstation. I've used my rocket blower. I've used my lens wipes. My station is clean. My camera is all set up. My negatives are ready to go. I've got my negatives up here on the table that I'm gonna be scanning next. Everything is clean. Everything is ready. Now I'm just going to slide in my first frame here and I've got it lined up using my grid lines. I'm going to blow off the negative. I'm going to check the light table one more time to see that everything is off. We're set. And now I'm going to take my first photo. So of course, what I didn't show is me setting up the whole uh, camera, lining it up with the mirror, nailing my focus using the macro lens here. Um, but now we're just going to keep Moving through here, I'm gonna keep lining these up and I'm not changing my exposure for any photos unless it's a very drastic difference. If it is very drastically overexposed or very drastically underexposed, then I'll use my shutter speed to compensate. And again, I'll keep an eye on my histogram like I showed you before, just to make sure that everything with my histogram is relatively central if possible. But as long as you're doing a good job or a decent job of shooting your film or you're using auto exposure and your camera does fine, then you should end up with negatives that are pretty consistent every time. So that quickly, we are finished with the roll of 120. So I'm gonna put this back in its sleeve because as soon as I'm done, I wanna protect my negatives and I'm gonna clean it off with the anti-static dust again, the cloth here, and then I'm gonna put it back in its sleeve and we'll switch over to 35 and I will show how I kind of maneuver this. I'll put in a little time lapse of kind of the process, but I'll also give you another tip how I've managed speeding that up. Silence is taken It's toll on my soul It's shaking the ceiling And the floorboards below I'm trying to climb I want to make mention of a couple more things as we move on. 
and I know that this is somewhat detail oriented. That's kind of how I do things. Uh, and if I have missed anything, please remember Q and A will come at some point. So drop me a question. I would love to get to any information or leave me an idea about how to improve this. Things I did wrong maybe, because uh, I know for a fact that there probably are. So something right now as I'm scanning 35 millimeter to be aware of, and it kind of brings it to my mind is that camera sensors, particularly modern mirrorless cameras are typically three by two. And so 35 millimeter is going to come close almost every time to perfectly filling the frame in terms of the aspect ratio. However, if the most large scale scans and prints are not your highest priority, and if you have a scanning system that allows you to see any of your borders, first of all, it's gonna make focusing a bit easier. And second of all, I like having the artistic freedom to choose to keep my film borders in my images or to get rid of them later on. I'm not concerned with the absolute largest scan because I'm not doing the absolute largest printing typically. So what you'll see in the scans when we bring them into Lightroom in a separate video is that you'll see that I am not filling the entirety of my sensor. I am just trying to capture what I need to get the photos that I want. And with medium format, of course, unless you're shooting uh, 645 or 6x9, it's going to be difficult for you to fill your entire sensor because 6x6 just doesn't do it, 6x7 won't do it. So there's a couple of options. You can either do uh, segmented images and then you can combine them in Lightroom later on. Um, that's a very popular method because you end up with incredibly high resolution, detailed scans. It's uh, basically kind of pixel shifting or you can just do what I do and get as close as possible to filling the frame and then be okay with losing the detail because for me, again, I'm not massively printing these images. I appreciate the detail that I can get, but I'm not going for the largest possible scans. So anyway, I got this all set up here where I just had to drop this down a little bit, refocus my image, and when focusing, I'm able to use my film border so that I'm actually focusing on the film itself, not the subject inside of the film photo, because that can be a common mistake that you make. Some people will tell you to focus on the grain of the image. I sometimes have a really hard time seeing it, so I just try and focus on a sprocket line or something on the piece of film, um, because sometimes I can't see the grain perfectly even when it's enlarged. So two last tips to mention are, of course, making sure that you use the manual focus features that come on a camera. Usually you should have focus peaking available to you as well as a digital zoom for focus check. So turn those both on, use the focus check to zoom in and then use the focus peaking to make sure that some part of your physical film, whether it's the sprocket or the film data is in focus and then you should have a perfectly focused image. The other tip is that to speed the whole workflow up, if you're scanning two different types of film like me with 120 and 135, I have made marks on my plumbing pipe here so that I know exactly where to stop because then I'm able to just line up the top of my Manfrotto super clamp with where I've drawn my line and then I'm able to easily move it back and forth. And so I've done this for uh, 135, I've done this for 135 panoramic, which this can do, and I've done this for 120 because those three require a different location here. So anyway, those are a few more little tips. And pretty much uh, from here, I won't, I won't go through it all, but um, I would just start the process just like I did with 120 where I've made sure that the entirety of my setup is clean. Everything is all ready to go. I've got my camera and my lens focused. I'm starting at the beginning here. Typically I'm on the emulsion side. So the kind of flat looking side of the film, the part that kind of looks matte, not glossy, um, is facing upward. 
and it's just because it's slightly less reflective of light and you'll see that your film is backwards. That's another way that you'll know that you're on the emulsion side. So it doesn't really matter what direction you scan your film. It doesn't really matter uh, if you scan it upside down or anything. It doesn't really matter if you scan the emulsion or the uh, glossy side. We're gonna pull it all into post later anyway and we'll be able to rotate and move it. So a lot of it's just preference, but again, I'm gonna line up each one of my images with the same line every time so that my crop is fast and consistent when I pull it into editing later and we'll go ahead and get started and I'll show you how quickly you move through a roll of 35 millimeter. Don't wanna tear it apart. I'm ready to start on this patchwork heart. So I think that just about covers it in terms of my film scanning equipment and my physical process. Once you're done, you can finally take off the gloves because I don't really like wearing cotton gloves as I go about my normal day. But that is all that you have to do on this side of the camera. It can feel a little bit daunting and overwhelming. You'll pick up a workflow, you'll find little quirks that make it faster, and you'll find ways to speed it up. And as you do that, I do recommend you write things down because that has really helped me to write things down so that when I go to scan film, because I don't do it frequently enough, I'm able to just pull up a note on my phone and say, oh right, this is kind of my checklist of things to go through. So if you have any questions about this part of my process or about future parts that are coming in the next videos, please leave them below. If you have tips for me, I know that my setup is not perfect. I know that my process and method here isn't perfect. I hope that uh, you'll see the results and that you'll be able to give me instructions on how to make them better if you know that. So anyway, that's all. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope that it helps you out and more videos will be coming.